Why does Venters want to save the cattle rustler he shot? How is he going to save anyone with the rustlers on his trail? Zane Gray, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. We couldn't do this without you. Your monthly donation helps in so many ways, and it also gives you access to more classic titles. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. Thank you so much. The Arsène Lupin podcast is out. Be sure to subscribe to our Gentleman Burglar's own show and tell your friends. And finally, if you'd like to be an Audible reviewer, here's your chance. I just finished an amazing project, and we need to get some reviews on Audible to help give it some traction. CBS News reporter Charles Gomez was fearless when facing down dictators. Earning an Emmy and an Edward R. Murrow Award, the Latin correspondent and son of a Cuban immigrant seemed on top of the world. But the terror of exposing his sexuality and AIDS diagnosis led him down a dark path of drugs and depression that nearly destroyed him. If you'd like to listen and review this audiobook for Audible, please reach out to mail at classictalesaudiobooks.com. I'll send you a free copy and a huge thanks for your help. This week, we continue our series of Riders of the Purple Sage by Zane Grey. Today, we return to Venters and his dilemma. He had just shot the famed Masked Rider, afterwards discovering that the rider was, in fact, an unarmed young woman. And now, Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 4 of 12 by Zane Grey. Chapter 8. Surprise Valley Back in that strange canyon, which Venters had found indeed a valley of surprises, the wounded girl's whispered appeal, almost like a prayer, not to take her back to the rustlers, crowned the events of the last few days with a confounding climax. That she should not want to return to them staggered Venters. Presently, as logical thought returned, her appeal confirmed his first impression, that she was more unfortunate than bad, and he experienced a sensation of gladness. If he had known before that Oldring's masked rider was a woman, his opinion would have been formed, and he would have considered her abandoned. But his first knowledge had come when he lifted a white face, quivering in a convulsion of agony. He had heard God's name whispered by blood-stained lips. Through her solemn and awful eyes, he had caught a glimpse of her soul, and just now had come the entreaty to him. Don't take me back there. Once for all, Venter's quick mind formed a permanent conception of this poor girl. He based it not upon what the chances of life had made her, but upon the revelation of dark eyes that pierced the infinite, upon a few pitiful, halting words that betrayed failure and wrong and misery. It breathed the truth of a tragic fate rather than a natural leaning to evil. What's your name? he inquired. Bess, she answered. Bess what? That's enough. Just Bess. The red that deepened in her cheeks was not all the flush of fever. Venters marveled anew, and this time at the tint of shame in her face, at the momentary drooping of long lashes. She might be a rustler's girl, but she was still capable of shame. She might be dying, but she still clung to some little remnant of honor. Very well, Bess, it doesn't matter, he said. But this matters. What shall I do with you? Are you a writer? She whispered. Not now. I was once, 
I drove the Witherstein herds, but I lost my place, lost all I owned, and now I'm, I'm a sort of outcast. My name's Byrne Vanters. You won't take me to Cottonwoods or Glaze? I'd be hanged. No, indeed. But I must do something with you, for it's not safe for me here. I shot that rustler who was with you. Sooner or later he'll be found, and then my tracks. I must find a safer hiding place where I can't be trailed. Leave me here. Alone? To die? Yes. I will not. Venter spoke shortly with a kind of ring in his voice. What do you want to do with me? Her whispering grew difficult, so low and faint that Venters had to stoop to hear her. Why, let's see, he replied slowly. I'd like to take you someplace where I could watch by you, nurse you, till you're all right. And then... Well, it'll be time to think of that when you're cured of your wound. It's a bad one. And, Bess, if you don't want to live, if you don't fight for life, you'll never... Oh, I want to live. I'm afraid to die. But I'd rather die than go back to... To... To Oldring? Asked Venters, interrupting her in turn. Her lips moved in an affirmative. I promise you not to take you back to him, or to Cottonwoods, or to Glaze. The mournful earnestness of her gaze suddenly shone with unutterable gratitude and wonder. And as suddenly, Venters found her eyes beautiful, as he had never seen or felt beauty. They were as dark blue as the sky at night. Then the flashing changed to a long, thoughtful look, in which there was a wistful, unconscious searching of his face, a look that trembled on the verge of hope and trust. I'll try to live, she said. The broken whisper just reached his ears. Do what you want with me. Rest then. Don't worry. Sleep, he replied. Abruptly, he arose as if words had been decisioned for him, and with a sharp command to the dogs, he strode from the camp. Venters was conscious of an indefinite conflict of change within him. It seemed to be a vague passing of old moods, a dim coalescing of new forces, a moment of inexplicable transition. He was both cast down and uplifted. He wanted to think, and think of the meaning, but he resolutely dispelled emotion. His imperative need at present was to find a safe retreat, and this called for action. So he set out. It still wanted several hours before dark. This trip, he turned to the left, and wended his skulking way southward a mile or more to the opening of the valley, where lay the strange, scrawled rocks. He did not, however, venture boldly out into the open sage, but clung to the right-hand wall and went along that till its perpendicular line broke into the long incline of bare stone. Before proceeding farther, he halted, studying the strange character of this slope and realizing that a moving black object could be seen far against such a background. Before him ascended a gradual swell of smooth stone. It was hard, polished, and full of pockets worn by centuries of eddying rainwater. A hundred yards up began a line of grotesque cedar trees, and they extended along the slope clear to its most southerly end. Beyond that end, Venters wanted to get, and he concluded the cedars, few as they were, would afford some cover. Therefore he climbed swiftly. The trees were farther up than he had estimated, though he had, from long habit, made allowance for the deceiving nature of distances in that country. When he gained the cover of cedars, he paused to rest and look. And it was then he saw how the trees sprang from holes in the bare rock. Ages of rain had run down the slope, circling, eddying in depressions, wearing deep 
round holes. There had been dry seasons, accumulations of dust, wind-blown seeds, and cedars rose wonderfully out of solid rock. But these were not beautiful cedars. They were gnarled, twisted into weird contortions, as if growth were torture, dead at the tops, shrunken, gray, and old. Theirs had been a bitter fight, and Venturis felt a strange sympathy for them. This country was hard on trees and men. He slipped from cedar to cedar, keeping them between him and the open valley. As he progressed, the belt of trees widened, and he kept to its upper margin. He passed shady pockets half full of water, and as he marked the location for possible future need, he reflected that there had been no rain since the winter snows. From one of these shady holes, a rabbit hopped out and squatted down, laying its ears flat. Venters wanted fresh meat now, more than when he had only himself to think of, but it would not do to fire his rifle there. So he broke off a cedar branch and threw it. He crippled the rabbit, which started to flounder up the slope. Venters did not wish to lose the meat, and he never allowed crippled game to escape, to die lingeringly in some covert. So after a careful glance below and back toward the canyon, he began to chase the rabbit. The fact that rabbits generally ran uphill was not new to him, but it presently seemed singular why this rabbit, that might have escaped downward, chose to ascend the slope. Venters knew then that it had a burrow higher up. More than once, he jerked over to seize it, only in vain, for the rabbit, by renewed effort, eluded his grasp. Thus the chase continued on up the bare slope. The farther Venters climbed, the more determined he grew to catch his quarry. At last, panting and sweating, he captured the rabbit at the foot of a steeper grade. Laying his rifle on the bulge of rising stone, he killed the animal and slung it from his belt. Before starting down, he waited to catch his breath. He had climbed far up that wonderful smooth slope, and had almost reached the base of yellow cliff that rose skyward, a huge, scarred and cracked bulk. It frowned down upon him, as if to forbid further ascent. Venters bent over for his rifle, and as he picked it up from where it leaned against the steeper grade, he saw several nicks cut in the solid stone. They were only a few inches deep and about a foot apart. Venters began to count them. One, two, three, four, on up to sixteen. That number carried his glance to the top of his first bulging bench of cliff base. Above, after a more level offset, was still steeper slope, and the line of nicks kept on, to wind round a projecting corner of wall. A casual glance would have passed by these little dents. If Venters had not known what they signified, he would never have bestowed upon them the second glance. But he knew they had been cut there by hand, and though age-worn, he recognized them as steps cut in the rock by cliff-dwellers. With a pulse beginning to beat and hammer away his calmness, he eyed that indistinct line of steps, up to where the buttress of wall hid further sight of them. He knew that behind the corner of stone would be a cave or a crack that could never be suspected from below. Chance, that had sported with him of late, now directed him to a probable hiding place. Again, he laid aside his rifle, and removing boots and belt, he began to walk up the steps. Like a mountain goat, he was agile, sure-footed, and he mounted the first bench without bending to use his hands. The next ascent took grip of fingers as well as toes, but he climbed steadily, swiftly, to reach the projecting corner, and slipped around it. Here he faced a notch in the cliff. At the apex, he turned abruptly into a ragged vent that split the ponderous wall clear to the top, showing a narrow streak of blue sky. At the base, this vent was dark, cool, and smelled of dry, musty dust. It zigzagged, so that he could not see ahead more than a few yards at a time. He noticed tracks of wildcats and rabbits in the dusty floor. 
At every turn he expected to come upon a huge cavern full of little square stone houses, each with a small aperture like a staring dark eye. The passage lightened and widened, and opened at the foot of a narrow, steep, ascending chute. Venders had a moment's notice of the rock, which was of the same smoothness and hardness as the slope below, before his gaze went irresistibly upward to the precipitous walls of this wide ladder of granite. These were ruined walls of yellow sandstone, and so split and splintered, so overhanging with great sections of balancing rim, so impending with tremendous crumbling crags, that Venters caught his breath sharply, and appalled, he instinctively recoiled, as if a step upward might jar the ponderous cliffs from their foundation. Indeed, it seemed that these ruined cliffs were but awaiting a breath of wind to collapse and come tumbling down. Venters hesitated. It would be a foolhardy man who risked his life under the leaning, waiting avalanches of rock in that gigantic split. Yet how many years had they leaned there without falling? At the bottom of the incline was an immense heap of weathered sandstone, all crumbling to dust. But there were no huge rocks as large as houses, such as rested so lightly and frightfully above, waiting patiently and inevitably to crash down. Slowly split from the parent rock by the weathering process, and carved and sculptured by ages of wind and rain, they waited their moment. Venters felt how foolish it was for him to fear these broken walls, to fear that, after they had endured for thousands of years, the moment of his passing should be the one for them to slip. Yet he feared it. What a place to hide, muttered Venters. I'll climb. I'll see where this thing goes. If only I can find water. With teeth tight shut, he essayed the incline. As he climbed, he bent his eyes downward. This, however, after a little, grew impossible. He had to look to obey his eager, curious mind. He raised his glance and saw light between row on row of shafts and pinnacles and crags that stood out from the main wall. Some leaned against the cliff, others against each other. Many stood sheer and alone. All were crumbling, cracked, rotten. It was a place of yellow, ragged ruin. The passage narrowed as he went up. It became a slant, hard for him to stick on. It was smooth as marble. Finally, he surmounted it, surprised to find the walls still several hundred feet high and a narrow gorge leading down on the other side. This was a divide between two inclines, about twenty yards wide. At one side stood an enormous rock. Venters gave it a second glance, because it rested on a pedestal. It attracted closer attention. It was like a colossal pair of stone standing on its stem. Around the bottom were thousands of little nicks, just distinguishable to the eye. They were marks of stone hatchets. The cliff dwellers had chipped and chipped away at this boulder till it rested its tremendous bulk upon a mere pinpoint of its surface. Venters pondered. Why had the little stone men hacked away at that big boulder? They bore no semblance to a statue or an idol or a godhead or a sphinx. Instinctively he put his hands on it and pushed, then his shoulder and heaved. The stone seemed to groan, to stir, to grate, and then to move. It tipped a little downward and hung, balancing for a long instant, slowly returned, rocked slightly, groaned, and settled back to its former position. Venters divined its significance. It had been meant for defense. The cliff dwellers, driven by dreaded enemies to this last stand, had cunningly cut the rock until it balanced perfectly, ready to be dislodged by strong hands. Just below it leaned a tottering crag that would have toppled, starting an avalanche on the acclivity where no sliding mass could stop. Crags and pinnacles, splintered cliffs, and leaning shafts and monuments would have thundered down to block forever the outlet 
to Deception Pass. That was a narrow shave for me, said Venters soberly. A balancing rock. The cliff dwellers never had to roll it. They died, vanished, and here the rock stands, probably little changed. But it might serve another lonely dweller of the cliffs. I'll hide up here somewhere, if I can only find water. He descended the gorge on the other side. The slope was gradual, the space narrow, the course straight for many rods. A gloom hung between the upsweeping walls. In a turn, the passage narrowed to scarce a dozen feet, and here was darkness of night. But light shone ahead. Another abrupt turn brought day again, and then wide open space. Above Venters loomed a wonderful arch of stone, bridging the canyon rims, and through the enormous round portal gleamed and glistened a beautiful valley, shining under sunset gold reflected by surrounding cliffs. He gave a start of surprise. The valley was a cove a mile long, half that wide, and its enclosing walls were smooth and stained and curved inward, forming great caves. He decided that its floor was far higher than the level of Deception Pass and the intersecting canyons. No purple sage colored this valley floor. Instead, there were the white of aspens, streaks of branch and slender trunk glistening from the green of leaves and the darker green of oaks. And through the middle of this forest, from wall to wall, ran a winding line of brilliant green which marked the course of cottonwoods and willows. There is water here, and this is the place for me, said Venters. Only birds can peep over those walls. I've gone oldering one better. Venters waited no longer and turned swiftly to retrace his steps. He named the canyon Surprise Valley and the huge boulder that guarded the outlet Balancing Rock. Going down, he did not find himself attended by such fears as had beset him in the climb. Still, he was not easy in mind and could not occupy himself with plans of moving the girl and his outfit until he had descended to the notch. There he rested a moment and looked about him. The pass was darkening with the approach of night. At the corner of the wall, where the stone steps turned, he saw a spur of rock that would serve to hold the noose of a lasso. He needed no more aid to scale that place. As he intended to make the move under cover of darkness, he wanted most to be able to tell where to climb up. So, taking several small stones with him, he stepped and slid down to the edge of the slope where he had left his rifle and boots. He placed the stones some yards apart. He left the rabbit lying upon the bench where the steps began. Then he addressed a keen-sighted, remembering gaze to the rim wall above. It was serrated, and between two spears of rock, directly in line with his position, showed a zigzag crack that at night would let through a gleam of sky. This settled. He put on his belt and boots and prepared to descend. Some consideration was necessary to decide whether or not to leave his rifle there. On the return, carrying the girl and a pack, it would be adding encumbrance, and after debating the matter, he left the rifle leaning against the bench. As he went straight down the slope, he halted every few rods to look up at his mark on the rim. It changed, but he fixed each change in his memory. When he reached the first cedar tree, he tied his scarf upon a dead branch and then hurried toward camp, having no more concern about finding his trail upon the return trip. Darkness soon emboldened and lent him greater speed. It occurred to him, as he glided into the grassy glade near camp and heard the whinny of a horse, that he had forgotten Wrangle. The big sorrel could not be gotten into Surprise Valley. He would have to be left here. Venters determined at once to lead the other horses out through the thicket and turn them loose. The farther they wandered from this canyon, the better it would suit him. He easily described Wrangle through the gloom, but the others were not in sight. Venters whistled low for the dogs, and when they came trotting to him, he sent them out to search for the horses and followed. 
it soon developed that they were not in the glade nor the thicket. Venters grew cold and rigid at the thought of rustlers having entered his retreat. But the thought passed, for the demeanor of Ring and Whitey reassured him. The horses had wandered away. Under the clump of silver spruces, a denser mantle of darkness, yet not so thick that Venter's night-practiced eyes could not catch the white oval of a still face. He bent over it, with a slight suspension of breath that was both caution lest he frighten her, and chill uncertainty of feeling lest he find her dead. But she slept, and he arose to renewed activity. He packed his saddlebags. The dogs were hungry. They whined about him and nosed his busy hands. But he took no time to feed them, nor to satisfy his own hunger. He slung the saddlebags over his shoulders and made them secure with his lasso. Then he wrapped the blankets closer about the girl and lifted her in his arms. Wrangel whinnied and thumped the ground as Venters passed him with the dogs. The sorrel knew he was being left behind. I was not sure whether he liked it or not. Venters went on and entered the thicket. Here he had to feel his way in pitch blackness and to wedge his progress between the close saplings. Time meant little to him now that he had started, and he edged along with slow side movement till he got clear of the thicket. Ring and Whitey stood waiting for him. Taking to the open aisles and patches of the sage, he walked guardedly careful not to stumble or step in dust or strike against spreading sage branches. If he were burdened, he did not feel it. From time to time, when he passed out of the black lines of shade into the wan starlight, he glanced at the white face of the girl lying in his arms. She had not awakened from her sleep or stupor. He did not rest until he cleared the black gate of the canyon. Then he leaned against a stone breast high to him, and gently released the girl from his hold. His brow and hair and the palms of his hands were wet, and there was a kind of nervous contraction of his muscles. They seemed to ripple and string tense. He had a desire to hurry and no sense of fatigue. A wind blew the scent of sage in his face. The first early blackness of night passed with the brightening of the stars. Somewhere back on his trail, a coyote yelped, splitting the dead silence. Venter's faculties seemed singularly acute. He lifted the girl again and pressed on. The valley afforded better traveling than the canyon. It was lighter, freer of sage, and there were no rocks. Soon, out of the pale gloom showed a still paler thing, and that was the low swell of slope. Venter's mounted it, and his dogs walked beside him. Once upon the stone, he slowed to snail pace, straining his sight to avoid the pockets and holes. Foot by foot he went up. The weird cedars, like great demons and witches chained to the rock and writhing in silent anguish, loomed up with wide and twisting naked arms. Venters crossed this belt of cedars, skirted the upper border, and recognized the tree he had marked, even before he saw his waving scarf. Here he knelt and deposited the girl gently, feet first, and slowly laid her out full length. What he feared was to reopen one of her wounds, if he gave her a violent jar or slipped and fell. But the supreme confidence, so strangely felt that night, admitted no such blunders. The slope before him seemed to swell into obscurity, to lose its definite outline in a misty, opaque cloud shaded into the overshadowing wall. He scanned the rim, where the serrated points speared the sky, and he found the zigzag crack. It was dim, only a shade lighter than the dark ramparts, but he distinguished it, and that served. Lifting the girl, he stepped upward, closely attending to the nature of the path under his feet. After a few steps, he stopped to mark his line with the crack in the rim, the dogs clung closer to him. While chasing the rabbit, this slope had appeared interminable to him. Now, burdened as he was, he did not think of length or height or toil. He remembered only to avoid a misstep and to keep his direction. He climbed on, 
with frequent stops to watch the rim. And before he dreamed of gaining the bench, he bumped his knees into it and saw, in the dim graying light, his rifle and the rabbit. He had come straight up without mishap or swerving off his course, and his shut teeth unlocked. As he laid the girl down in the shallow hollow of the little ridge, with her white face upturned, she opened her eyes. Wide, staring black, at once like both the night and the stars, they made her face seem whiter. Is it you? she asked faintly. Yes, replied Venters. Oh, where are we? I'm taking you to a safe place where no one will ever find you. I must climb a little here and call the dogs. Don't be afraid. I'll soon come for you. She said no more. Her eyes watched him steadily for a moment and then closed. Venters pulled off his boots and then felt for the little steps in the rock. The shade of the cliff above obscured the point he wanted to gain, but he could see dimly a few feet before him. What he had attempted with care he now went at with surprising lightness. Buoyant, rapid, sure, he attained the corner of wall and slipped around it. Here he could not see a hand before his face, so he groped along, found a little flat space, and there removed the saddlebags. The lasso he took back with him to the corner and looped the noose over the spur of rock. Ring, Whitey, come, he called softly. Low whines came up from below. Here, come, Whitey, ring, he repeated, this time sharply. Then followed the scraping of claws and pattering of feet, and out of the gray gloom below him swiftly climbed the dogs to reach his side and pass beyond. Venters descended, holding to the lasso. He tested its strength by throwing all his weight upon it. Then he gathered the girl up, and holding her securely in his left arm, he began to climb, at every few steps jerking his right hand upward along the lasso. It sagged at each forward movement he made, but he balanced himself lightly during the interval when he lacked the support of a taut rope. He climbed as if he had wings, the strength of a giant, and knew not the sense of fear. The sharp corner of cliff seemed to cut out of the darkness. He reached it and the protruding shelf, and then, entering the black shade of the notch, he moved blindly but surely to the place where he had left the saddlebags. He heard the dogs, though he could not see them. Once more he carefully placed the girl at his feet. Then, on hands and knees, he went over the little flat space, feeling for stones. He removed a number, and scraping the deep dust into a heap, he unfolded the outer blanket from around the girl and laid her upon this bed. Then he went down the slope again for his boots, rifle, and the rabbit, bringing also his lasso with him. He made short work of that trip. Are you there? The girl's voice came low from the blackness. Yes, he replied, and was conscious that his laboring breast made speech difficult. Are we in the cave? Yes. Oh, listen. The waterfall. I hear it. You've brought me back. Venters heard a murmuring moan that one moment swelled to a pitch, almost softly shrill, and the next lulled to a low, almost inaudible sigh. That's wind blowing in the cliffs, he panted. You're far from Oldring's canyon. The effort it cost him to speak made him conscious of extreme lassitude following upon great exertion. It seemed that when he lay down and drew his blanket over him, the action was the last before utter prostration. He stretched inert, wet, hot, his body one great strife of throbbing, stinging nerves and bursting veins. And there he lay for a long while before he felt that he had begun to rest. Rest came to him that night, but no sleep. Sleep he did not want. The hours of strained effort were now as if they had never been, and he wanted to think. Earlier in the day, 
he had dismissed an inexplicable feeling of change. But now, when there was no longer demand on his cunning and strength, and he had time to think, he could not catch the elusive thing that had sadly perplexed as well as elevated his spirit. Above him, through a V-shaped cleft in the dark rim of the cliff, shone the lustrous stars that had been his lonely accusers for a long, long year. Tonight they were different. He studied them. Larger, whiter, and more radiant they seemed. But that was not the difference he meant. Gradually it came to him that the distinction was not one he saw, but one he felt. In this he divined as much of the baffling change as he thought would be revealed to him then. And as he lay there, with the singing of the cliff winds in his ears, the white stars above the dark, bold vent, the difference which he felt was that he was no longer alone. Chapter 9 Silver Spruce and Aspens The rest of that night seemed to Venters only a few moments of starlight, a dark overcasting of sky, an hour or so of gray gloom, and then the lighting of dawn. When he had bestirred himself, feeding the hungry dogs and breaking his long fast, and had repacked his saddlebags, it was clear daylight, though the sun had not tipped the yellow wall in the east. He concluded to make the climb and descent into Surprise Valley in one trip. To that end, he tied his blanket upon Ring and gave Whitey the extra lasso and the rabbit to carry. Then, with the rifle and saddlebags slung upon his back, he took up the girl. She did not awaken from heavy slumber. That climb up under the rugged, menacing brows of the broken cliffs, in the face of a grim, leaning boulder that seemed to be weary of its age-long wavering, was a tax on strength and nerve that Venters felt equally with something sweet and strangely exulting in its accomplishment. He did not pause until he gained the narrow divide, and there he rested. Balancing rock loomed huge, cold in the gray light of dawn, a thing without life, yet it spoke silently to Venters. I am waiting to plunge down, to shatter and crash, roar and boom, to bury your trail and close forever the outlet to deception pass. On the descent of the other side, Venters had easy going, but was somewhat concerned because Whitey appeared to have succumbed to temptation, and while carrying the rabbit, was also chewing on it. And Ring evidently regarded this as an injury to himself, especially as he had carried the heavier load. Presently he snapped at one end of the rabbit, and refused to let it go. But his action prevented Whitey from further misdoing, and then the two dogs pattered down, carrying the rabbit between them. Venters turned out of the gorge, and suddenly paused stock still, astounded at the scene before him. The curve of the great stone bridge had caught the sunrise, and through the magnificent arch burst a glorious stream of gold that shone with the long slant down into the center of Surprise Valley. Only through the arch did any sunlight pass, so that all the rest of the valley lay still asleep, dark green, mysterious, shadowy, merging its level into walls as misty and soft as morning clouds. Venters then descended, passing through the arch, looking up at its tremendous height and sweep. It spanned the opening to Surprise Valley, stretching an almost perfect curve from rim to rim. Even in his hurry and concern, Venters could not but feel its majesty, and the thought came to him that the cliff dwellers must have regarded it as an object of worship. Down, 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 Venters strode, more and more feeling the weight of his burden as he descended, and still the valley lay below him, as all other canyons and coves and valleys had deceived him, so had this deep, nestling oval. At length, he passed beyond the slope of weathered stone that spread fan-shape from the arch and encountered a grassy terrace running to the right and about on a level with the tips of the oaks and cottonwoods below. Scattered here and there upon this shelf 
were clumps of aspens, and he walked through them into a glade that surpassed in beauty and adaptability for a wild home any place he had ever seen. Silver spruces bordered the base of a precipitous wall that rose loftily. Caves indented its surface, and there were no detached ledges or weathered sections that might dislodge a stone. The level ground, beyond the spruces, dropped down into a little ravine. This was one dense line of slender aspens from which came the low splashing of water. And the terrace, lying open to the west, afforded unobstructed view of the valley of green treetops. For his camp, Venters chose a shady, grassy plot between the silver spruces and the cliff. Here, in the stone wall, had been wonderfully carved by wind or washed by water several deep caves above the level of the terrace. They were clean, dry, roomy. He cut spruce boughs and made a bed in the largest cave and laid the girl there. The first intimation that he had of her being aroused from sleep or lethargy was the low call for water. He hurried down into the ravine with his canteen. It was a shallow, grass-green place, with aspens growing up everywhere. To his delight, he found a tiny brook of swift-running water. Its faint tinge of amber reminded him of the spring at Cottonwoods, and the thought gave him a little shock. The water was so cold it made his fingers tingle as he dipped the canteen. Having returned to the cave, he was glad to see the girl drink thirstily. This time, he noted that she could raise her head slightly without his help. You were thirsty, he said. It's good water. I've found a fine place. Tell me, how do you feel? There's pain here, she replied, and moved her hand to her left side. Why, well, that's strange. Your wounds are on your right side. I believe you're hungry. Is the pain a kind of dull ache? A gnawing? It's like that. Then it's hunger. Venters laughed, and suddenly caught himself with a quick breath, and felt again the little shock. When had he laughed? It's hunger, he went on. I've had that gnaw many a time. I've got it now. But you mustn't eat. You can have all the water you want, but no food just yet. Won't I starve? No. People don't starve easily. I've discovered that. You must lie perfectly still and rest and sleep for days. My hands are dirty. My face feels so hot and sticky. My boots hurt. It was her longest speech as yet, and it trailed off in a whisper. Well, I'm a fine nurse. It annoyed him that he had never thought of these things. But then awaiting her death and thinking of her comfort were vastly different matters. He unwrapped the blanket which covered her. What a slender girl she was. No wonder he had been able to carry her miles and pack her up that slippery ladder of stone. Her boots were of soft, fine leather, reaching clear to her knees. He recognized the make as one of a bootmaker in Sterling. Her spurs, that he had stupidly neglected to remove, consisted of silver frames and gold chains, and the rowels, large as silver dollars, were fancifully engraved. The boots slipped off rather hard. She wore heavy woolen rider stockings, half-length, and these were pulled up over the ends of her short trousers. Venters took off the stockings to note her little feet were red and swollen. He bathed them. Then he removed his scarf and bathed her face and hands. I must see your wounds now he said gently. She made no reply, but watched him steadily as he opened her blouse and untied the bandage. His strong fingers trembled a little as he removed it. If the wounds had reopened, a chill struck him as he saw the angry red bullet mark and a tiny stream of blood winding from it down her white breast. Very carefully, he lifted her to see that the wound in her back had closed perfectly. Then he washed the blood from her breast, bathed the wound, and left it unbandaged, open to the air. 
Her eyes thanked him. Listen, he said earnestly. I've had some wounds, and I've seen many. I know a little about them. The hole in your back has closed. If you lie still three days, the one in your breast will close, and you'll be safe. The danger from hemorrhage will be over. He had spoken with earnest sincerity, almost eagerness. Why do you want me to get well? She asked wonderingly. The simple question seemed unanswerable, except on grounds of humanity. But the circumstances under which he had shot this strange girl, the shock and realization, the waiting for death, the hope, had resulted in a condition of mind where inventors wanted her to live more than he had ever wanted anything. Yet he could not tell why. He believed the killing of the rustler and the subsequent excitement had disturbed him. For how else could he explain the throbbing of his brain, the heat of his blood, the undefined sense of full hours, charged, vibrant with pulsating mystery, where once they had dragged in loneliness? I shot you, he said slowly, and I want you to get well, so I shall not have killed a woman, but for your own sake, too. A terrible bitterness darkened her eyes, and her lips quivered. Hush, said Venters. You talk too much already. In her unutterable bitterness, he saw a darkness of mood that could not have been caused by her present weak and feverish state. She hated the life she had led, that she probably had been compelled to lead. She had suffered some unforgivable wrong at the hands of Oldring. With that conviction, Venters felt a shame throughout his body, and it marked the rekindling of fierce anger and ruthlessness. In the past long year he had nursed resentment. He had hated the wilderness, the loneliness of the uplands. He had waited for something to come to pass. It had come. Like an Indian stealing horses, he had skulked into the recesses of the canyons. He had found Oldring's retreat. He had killed a rustler. He had shot an unfortunate girl, then had saved her from this unwitting act, and he meant to save her from the consequent wasting of blood, from fever and weakness. Starvation he had to fight for her and for himself. Where he had been sick at the letting of blood, now he remembered it in grim, cold calm. And as he lost that softness of nature, so he lost his fear of men. He would watch for Oldring, biding his time, and he would kill this great black-bearded rustler who had held a girl in bondage, who had used her to his infamous ends. Venters surmised this much of the change in him. Idleness had passed. Keen, fierce vigor flooded his mind and body. All that had happened to him at Cottonwoods seemed remote and hard to recall. The difficulties and perils of the present absorbed him held him in a kind of spell. First, then, he fitted up the little cave adjoining the girl's room for his own comfort and use. His next work was to build a fireplace of stones and to gather a store of wood. That done, he spilled the contents of his saddlebags upon the grass and took stock. His outfit consisted of a small-handled axe, a hunting knife, a large number of cartridges for rifle or revolver, a tin plate, a cup, and a fork and spoon, a quantity of dried beef and dried fruits, and small canvas bags containing tea, sugar, salt, and pepper. For him alone this supply would have been bountiful to begin a sojourn in the wilderness, but he was no longer alone. Starvation in the uplands was not an unheard-of thing. He did not, however, worry at all on that score and feared only his possible inability to supply the needs of a woman in a weakened and extremely delicate condition. If there was no game in the valley, a contingency he doubted, it would not be a great task for him to go by night to Aldring's herd and pack out a calf. The exigency of the moment was to ascertain if there were game in Surprise Valley. Whitey had guarded the dilapidated rabbit, 
and Ring slept nearby under a spruce. Venters called Ring and went to the edge of the terrace, and there halted to survey the valley. He was prepared to find it larger than his unstudied glances had made it appear. For more than a casual idea of dimensions and a hasty conception of oval shape and singular beauty, he had not had time. Again, the felicity of the name he had given the valley struck him forcibly. Around the red perpendicular walls, except under the great arc of stone, ran a terrace fringed at the cliff base by silver spruces. Below that first terrace, sloped another, wider one, densely overgrown with aspens. In the center of the valley was a level circle of oaks and alders, with the glittering green line of willows and cottonwood dividing it in half. Venter saw a number and variety of birds flitting among the trees. To his left, facing the stone bridge, an enormous cavern opened in the wall, and low down, just above the treetops, he made out a long shelf of cliff dwellings, with little black, staring windows or doors. Like eyes they were, and seemed to watch him. The few cliff dwellings he had seen, all ruins, had left him with haunting memory of age and solitude, and of something past. He had come, in a way, to be a cliff dweller himself, and those silent eyes would look down upon him, as if in surprise that after thousands of years a man had invaded the valley. Venters felt sure that he was the only white man who had ever walked under the shadow of the wonderful stone bridge, down into that wonderful valley, with its circle of caves and its terraced rings of silver spruce and aspens. The dog growled below and rushed into the forest. Venters ran down the declivity to enter a zone of light shade streaked with sunshine. The oak trees were slender, none more than half a foot thick, and they grew close together, intermingling their branches. Ring came running back with a rabbit in his mouth. Venters took the rabbit, and holding the dog near him, stole softly on. There were fluttering of wings among the branches and quick bird notes, and rustling of dead leaves and rapid patterings. Venters crossed well-worn trails marked with fresh tracks, and when he had stolen on a little farther, he saw many birds and running quail, and more rabbits than he could count. He had not penetrated the forest of oaks for a hundred yards, had not approached anywhere near the line of willows and cottonwoods, which he knew grew along a stream. But he had seen enough to know that Surprise Valley was the home of many wild creatures. Venters returned to camp. He skinned the rabbits and gave the dogs the one they had quarreled over. In the skin of this he dressed and hung up to dry, feeling that he would like to keep it. It was a particularly rich, furry pelt, with a beautiful white tail. Venters remembered that, but for the bobbing of that white tail catching his eye, he would not have espied the rabbit, and he would never have discovered Surprise Valley. Little incidents of chance like this had turned him here and there in Deception Pass, and now they had assumed to him the significance and direction of destiny. His good fortune in the matter of game at hand brought to his mind the necessity of keeping it in the valley. Therefore he took the axe and cut bundles of aspens and willows, and packed them up under the bridge to the narrow outlet of the gorge. Here he began fashioning a fence, by driving aspens into the ground and lacing them fast with willows. Trip after trip he made down for more building material, and the afternoon had passed when he finished the work to his satisfaction. Wildcats might scale the fence, but no coyote could come in to search for prey, and no rabbits or other small game could escape the valley. Upon returning to camp, he set about getting his supper at ease, around a fine fire, without hurry or fear of discovery. After hard work that had definite purpose, this freedom and comfort gave him peculiar satisfaction. He caught himself often, as he kept busy round the campfire, stopping to glance at the quiet form in the cave, and at the dogs stretched cozily near him, and then out across the beautiful valley. The present was not yet real to him. While he ate, the sun set beyond a dip in the rim of the curved wall. As the morning sun burst wondrously through a grand arch into this valley, 
in a golden, slanting shaft, so the evening sun, at the moment of setting, shone through a gap of cliffs, sending down a broad red burst to brighten the oval with a blaze of fire. To Venters, both sunrise and sunset were unreal. A cool wind blew across the oval, waving the tips of oaks, and, while the light lasted, fluttering the aspen leaves into millions of facets of red and sweeping the graceful spruces. Then, with the wind, soon came a shade and a darkening, and suddenly the valley was gray. Night came there quickly after the sinking of the sun. Venters went softly to look at the girl. She slept, and her breathing was quiet and slow. He lifted Ring into the cave, with stern whisper for him to stay there on guard. Then he drew the blanket carefully over her and returned to the campfire. Though exceedingly tired, he was yet loath to yield to lassitude. But this night it was not from listening, watchful vigilance. It was from a desire to realize his position. The details of his wild environment seemed the only substance of a strange dream. He saw the darkening rims, the gray oval turning black, the undulating surface of the forest like a rippling lake, and the spear-pointed spruces. He heard the flutter of aspen leaves and the soft, continuous splash of falling water. The melancholy note of a canyon bird broke clear and lonely from the high cliffs. Venters had no name for this night singer, and he had never seen one. But the few notes, always peeling out just at darkness, were as familiar to him as the canyon silence. Then they ceased, and the rustle of leaves and the murmur of water hushed in a growing sound that Venters fancied was not of earth. Neither had he a name for this, only it was inexpressibly wild and sweet. The thought came that it might be a moan of the girl in her last outcry of life, and he felt a tremor shake him. But no, this sound was not human, though it was like despair. He began to doubt his sensitive perceptions, to believe that he half dreamed what he thought he heard. Then the sound swelled with the strengthening of the breeze, and he realized it was the singing of the wind in the cliffs. By and by, a drowsiness overcame him, and Venters began to nod, half asleep, with his back against a spruce. Rousing himself and calling Whitey, he went to the cave. The girl lay barely visible in the dimness. Ring crouched beside her, and the padding of his tail on the stone assured Venters that the dog was awake and faithful to his duty. Venters sought his own bed of fragrant boughs, and as he lay back, somehow grateful for the comfort and safety, the night seemed to steal away from him and he sank softly into intangible space and rest and slumber. Venters awakened to the sound of melody that he imagined was only the haunting echo of dream music. He opened his eyes to another surprise of this valley of beautiful surprises. Out of his cave, he saw the exquisitely fine foliage of the silver spruces crossing a round space of blue morning sky. And in this lacy leafage, fluttered a number of gray birds with black and white stripes and long tails. They were mockingbirds, but they were singing as if they wanted to burst their throats. Venters listened. One long silver-tipped branch dropped almost to his cave, and upon it, within a few yards of him, sat one of the graceful birds. Venters saw the swelling and quivering of its throat in song. He arose, and when he slid down out of his cave, the birds fluttered and flew farther away. Venters stepped before the opening of the other cave and looked in. The girl was awake. With wide eyes and listening look, she had a hand on Ring's neck. Mockingbirds, she said. Yes, replied Venters, and I believe they like our company. Where are we? Never mind now. After a little, I'll tell you. The birds woke me, when I heard them, and saw the shiny trees, and the blue sky, and then a blaze of gold dropping down. I wondered. She did not complete her fancy, but Venters imagined he understood her meaning. 
She appeared to be wandering in mind. Venters felt her face and hands and found them burning with fever. He went for water and was glad to find it almost as cold as if flowing from ice. That water was the only medicine he had, and he put faith in it. She did not want to drink, but he made her swallow, and then he bathed her face and head and cooled her wrists. The day began with the heightening of the fever. Venter spent the time reducing her temperature, cooling her hot cheeks and temples. He kept close watch over her, and at the least indication of restlessness that he knew led to tossing and rolling of the body, he held her tightly, so no violent move could reopen her wounds. Hour after hour, she babbled and laughed and cried and moaned in delirium. But whatever her secret was, she did not reveal it. Attended by something somber for venters, the day passed. At night in the cool winds, the fever abated, and she slept. The second day was a repetition of the first. On the third, he seemed to see her wither and waste away before his eyes. That day he scarcely went from her side for a moment, except to run for fresh cool water, and he did not eat. The fever broke on the fourth day and left her spent and shrunken, a slip of a girl with life only in her eyes. They hung upon Venters with a mute observance, and he found hope in that. To rekindle the spark that had nearly flickered out, to nourish the little life and vitality that remained in her, was Venter's problem. But he had little resource other than the meat of the rabbits and quail, and from these he made broths and soups as best he could, and fed her with a spoon. It came to him that the human body, like the human soul, was a strange thing, and capable of recovering from terrible shocks. For almost immediately she showed faint signs of gathering strength. There was one more waiting day, in which he doubted, and spent long hours by her side as she slept, and watched the gentle swell of her breast rise and fall in breathing, and the wind stir the tangled chestnut curls. On the next day, he knew that she would live. Upon realizing it, he abruptly left the cave and sought his accustomed seat against the trunk of a big spruce, where once more he let his glance stray along the sloping terraces. She would live, and the somber gloom lifted out of the valley, and he felt relief that was pain. When he roused to the call of action, to the many things he needed to do in the way of making camp fixtures and utensils, to the necessity of hunting food and the desire to explore the valley. But he decided to wait a few more days before going far from camp, because he fancied that the girl rested easier when she could see him near at hand. And on the first day, her languor appeared to leave her in a renewed grip of life. She awoke stronger from each short slumber. She ate greedily, and she moved about in her bed of boughs, and always, it seemed to Venters, her eyes followed him. He knew now that her recovery would be rapid. She talked about the dogs, about the caves, the valley, and how hungry she was, till Venters silenced her, asking her to put off further talk till another time. She obeyed, but she sat up in her bed, and her eyes roved to and fro, and always back to him. Upon the second morning, she sat up when he awakened her, and would not permit him to bathe her face and feed her, which actions she performed for herself. She spoke little, however, and Venters was quick to catch in her the first intimations of thoughtfulness and curiosity and appreciation of her situation. He left camp and took Whitey out to hunt for rabbits. Upon his return, he was amazed and somewhat anxiously concerned to see his invalid sitting with her back to a corner of the cave and her bare feet swinging out. Hurriedly he approached, intending to advise her to lie down again, to tell her that perhaps she might overtax her strength. The sun shone upon her, glinting on the little head with its tangle of bright hair and the small oval face with its pallor and dark blue eyes underlined by dark blue circles. She looked at him and he looked at her. In that exchange of glances, he imagined each saw the other 
in some different guise. It seemed impossible to Venters that this frail girl could be Aldring's masked rider. It flashed over him that he had made a mistake, which presently she would explain. Help me down, she said. But are you well enough? he protested. Wait a little longer. I'm weak, dizzy, but I want to get down. He lifted her. What a light burden now and stood her upright beside him, and supported her as she essayed to walk with halting steps. She was like a stripling of a boy. The bright, small head scarcely reached his shoulder. But now as she clung to his arm, the rider's costume she wore did not contradict, as it had done at first, his feeling of her femininity. She might be the famous masked rider of the uplands, she might resemble a boy, but her outline her little hands and feet, her hair, her big eyes and tremulous lips, and especially as something that Venters felt as a subtle essence rather than what he saw, proclaimed her sex. She soon tired. He arranged a comfortable seat for her under the spruce that overspread the campfire. Now tell me everything, she said. He recounted all that had happened from the time of his discovery of the rustlers in the canyon up to the present moment. You shot me, and now you've saved my life? Yes. After almost killing you, I've pulled you through. Are you glad? I should say so. Her eyes were unusually expressive, and they regarded him steadily. She was unconscious of that mirroring of her emotions and they shone with gratefulness and interest and wonder and sadness. Tell me about yourself, she asked. He made this a briefer story, telling of his coming to Utah, his various occupations till he became a rider, and then how the Mormons had practically driven him out of Cottonwoods, an outcast. Then, no longer able to withstand his own burning curiosity, he questioned her in turn. Are you Old Ring's masked rider? Yes, she replied, and dropped her eyes. I knew it. I recognized your figure and mask, for I saw you once. Yet I can't believe it. But you never were really that rustler, as we riders knew him. A thief, a marauder, a kidnapper of women, a murderer of sleeping riders. No, I never stole or harmed anyone in all my life. I only rode and rode. But why, why, he burst out, why the name? I understand Oldring made you ride, but the black mask, the mystery, the things laid to your hands, the threats in your infamous name, the night riding credited to you the evil deeds deliberately blamed on you and acknowledged by rustlers, even Aldring himself. Why? Tell me why. I never knew that, she answered low. Her drooping head straightened, and the large eyes, larger now and darker, met Venters with a clear, steadfast gaze in which he read the truth. It verified his own conviction. Never knew? That's strange. Are you a Mormon? No. Is Aldring a Mormon? No. Do you care for him? Yes. I hate his men, his life. Sometimes I almost hate him. Venters paused in his rapid-fire questioning, as if to brace himself to ask for a truth that would be abhorrent for him to confirm but which he seemed driven to hear. What are, what were you to Aldring? Like some delicate thing suddenly exposed to blasting heat, the girl wilted. Her head dropped, and into her white wasted cheeks crept the red of shame. Venters would have given anything to recall that question. It seemed so different, his thought, when spoken. Yet her shame established in his mind something akin to the respect he had strangely been hungering to feel for her. 
damn that question. Forget it, he cried, in a passion of pain for her and anger at himself. But once and for all, tell me. I know it, yet I want to hear you say so. You couldn't help yourself? Oh, no. Well, that makes it all right with me, he went on honestly. I... I want you to feel that... You see, we've been thrown together, and... And I want to help you, not hurt you. I thought life had been cruel to me, but when I think of yours, I feel mean and little for my complaining. Anyway, I was a lonely outcast, and now I don't see very clearly what it all means. Only we are here, together. We've got to stay here for long, surely till you are well. But you'll never go back to Oldring, and I'm sure helping you will help me, for I was sick in mind. There's something now for me to do, and if I can win back your strength, then get you away out of this wild country, help you somehow to a happier life. Just think how good that'll be for me. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 4 of 12, by Zane Gray. If you have enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. It's a great way to build your library of classic literature. Thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>